My name is Aiken Hart, and I'm the senior curator at the Noguchi Museum in New York, and I've known Lawrence for a fair time now, almost 10 years, and uh, we have done this before. Um, the dog and pony show, as Lawrence likes to say, although today we weren't able to decide who was the dog and who was the pony, but that's It doesn't okay. really matter. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> Except for the barking and the trotting, that's very important, but... As long as you don't shed. As long as I don't... <laughs> I can't promise that, honestly, but... Um, so I just want to say it's an incredible honor to be here. Uh, I would go anywhere on the planet for Lawrence, and um, I'm really, really honored to be part of this. Uh, it is amazing and wonderful uh, that he's receiving this award. No one is more deserving. Um, I do want to admit as well that this is somewhat terrifying because talking to Lawrence about art is sort of like talking to Galileo about the nature of the universe or Shakespeare about the nature of man or maybe Thomas Aquinas about the nature of existence. It's, it's a little bit scary. Um, but it's always fun, always a pleasure. And I just want to let you all know, too, you, you will remember this. Lawrence is a, an incredibly important figure. Um, I don't know if you've ever gotten happy with or, or how you feel at this point about the, the term conceptual art. I honestly, and I don't mean to be funny, I don't understand it. Yeah. Uh, I, it was done by, it was the, coined by a group of artists, some were interesting, some were good, some were not good that were afraid that what they did would not fit into the society and they might want to have a kid or live a normal life like people. And so they had to have a department in the university for it. And what could they call it? Art that wasn't the art that came before? So they called it conceptual art, but it also said that they were intelligent, that they were special, they were intellectuals. No, I'll be damned. I'm sorry, you can't make a painting without first figuring out the size, the color, stretching the canvas, putting it together, and putting it something on the surface. <laughs> there is no hierarchy in art. And the conceptual artists in the academic nonsense tried to make a hierarchy. And then what they did was they lost some of the talented people of their generation. So if somebody wants to say I was the grandfather of something, Okay, what the hell? But I, I don't feel it. I have a grandson, and, I, and I, I don't even feel paternal towards him. I feel great affection. But I, I, I'm not one of the... I don't need it. Thank you. I, what? Well, let's, let's broaden that out and just uh, talk a little bit about categorization because yes. um, I think one of the, the really important things, useful things that you've contributed, this, this sense of... Um, well, the suspiciousness about categorization and labeling, and you, you've often said that art's job is not to know what category other people are going to put it in. It, if it fits into the category, it fits, and there's nothing wrong with that. And there's really nothing wrong with, if you're impressed by something, trying to make a whole set of work like it. But it's not the function of art. Uh, if you know what it's going to be before you start, why make it? If it fits into the commercial structure at the time, why make it? Somebody else is obviously doing it well enough to have impressed you. Right, that gets at a sort of very fundamental question you have a lot to say about, which is what, what is art? What's the function of art? What's its job? It's a signpost for people to understand their relationship to whatever materials and whatever culture and on whatever level they find themselves to find their own place in the sun. Art is to be used. When you look at a painting, when you look at a sculpture, when you look at a work of mine, you use it to understand traversing in the society. It's a really deeply sculptural idea. A lot of people, including me, have struggled greatly to try to understand exactly how, because I'm from a pedant um, profession, um, is to figure out what exactly is sculptural about what you do and how you understand it as being sculptural. And I think that beautiful phrase, finding a place in the sun, is, is a key part of that. What do, what do you mean by that exactly? That unless you take the trouble and the, to give the dignity to materials, and any artist cannot make anything without the dignity in the materials, uh, once you do that, you've taken another place within the society. You've stepped outside of accepting what they said it was worth. And right now we're going through a phase in the world where there's people out there that they think they know what they stand for. And in fact, it never occurred to the person that they stood for that 
or that they are that nice. Certainly don't mean people in my situation. I mean people that are trying so hard to get through the door of anything. Art is one of those things that once you understand that it's about the relationships of human beings to objects, and it's about setting up a philosophical position, you're fine. You may not make a good living, you may not even make a living, but you're fine. You're not wasting your time. You're doing something worthwhile. Yes, you're making and you're a not wasting your time. Yeah, that's all. You said um, you have a, um, a formula that you've used a couple of times. It's really wonderful because there's so much um, sort of pathos in it. Um, you say, I'm not a doctor writing prescriptions. I'm, yeah. not an air, I'm not a pilot piloting an airplane. Nothing that important. And I just want to change the world. You don't have to be an artist. You really don't. You have to genuinely have something to say. And how it ends up looking and what you're placing someplace here is about you had something to say and you tried to attract attention with it. But you don't have to be anything particularly special. You just have to do it special. But your ambitions for it are quite special and spectacular. I mean, of you course. really, every piece you make, you really want to change the nature of the people who see it and of their relationship with each other. Yes, I do. But I don't think I succeed all the time. <laughs> And there's nothing wrong with that either. You, you talk all the time about we all make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Sometimes it's not even a mistake. Sometimes it's totally unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll stick behind anything I publicly show. But when you look at it and put it next to like a Mondrian and put it next to something else, that particular work might just not make it. <laughs> Um, so just talking a little bit about what art's function is, what about the artist's job? Because a lot of the students here are trying to figure out, find their sense of mission and understand what they want to accomplish in the world. From your perspective, what is the artist's role? What is the artist's job? How can you say that? How, how can you even think in terms of knowing what the role of the artist is when you don't even know what the hell it is they're going to make? And if he and she he or she starts to, to set up a marketing scheme, a support structure, and everything else for something that nobody has any idea what it is, because nobody's done it yet. It usually doesn't get done. Somebody just copies something that somebody else did and put it in another category. You've been really clear and honest over the years. You've, all of you should dip in because art, uh, Lawrence is as well interviewed as any artist in the history of the world probably. Um, many, many wonderful, hundred well-documented interviews, great interviews. Um, but you've been very clear that it took you a long time to figure out what you were doing. I'm not even, I'm not that sure right now. Right. <laughs> and I'm not the, being modest. I, I really don't understand. Honesty is not modesty. I sometimes am not sure. Uh, I, I was with some young people a while back in at some project, and they said, how the hell did you survive coming from the South Bronx, and da-da-da-da-da, and da-da-da-da-da. And I looked up and I just remembered Tennessee Williams' biography, The Kindness of Strangers. You just did it. Yeah. And now they, did it, they do it with a, a license, with a, a card that says that they're an artist. You don't need, it's the last, one of the last professions where you don't need a, a piece of paper. You don't need credentials. You either sing the song and do the dance or else you're not there. But you do need a personal sense of mission and it took you a while to yeah. get to the point where you were at least on the, the path that you followed, even if you're not always exactly sure where it's taken you. Oh, absolutely, the fact that it's an adventure. But it's a responsible adventure. You never put out anything that you're not sure will, you're not sure will not hurt somebody. You have to be sure that, because you see, making art is probably the most aggressive thing you can do in life. You destroy people's dreams. You literally sit down and sometimes with just a pencil and a paper, and not pronouncing anything, make something that makes somebody's fantasy of the things that they wanted as from a child on no longer useful. That's destroying dreams, that's aggressive. I mean, the quote is that all art is made from anger, but anger at what? We're not happy with the configuration of the world we live in. 
Nobody basically is, with the exception of people who either take too many ups or something. But essentially, you don't agree with the way the world presents itself. So you set about trying to set up another configuration. And I think that's what you call art. Um, let's to just follow that along a little bit because I think one of, one of the things I find so, much, so interesting about you, you really don't believe in imposing yourself on other people and imposing yourself on the public. Um, you put art out there in the public and you want people to discover it and engage with it and have it change their lives, be meaningful to them, but you don't believe in, in um, sort of confrontational art. You often refer sort of it's, conf it's confrontational in its, in, its in its content. But I never liked artists who said, you, you do this and you do this and you do that. I, I don't get it. Are they so sure? It's much better to lay it out there and let somebody be enticed. So, so you're, you're responsible for creating some of the sort of archetypal language that is associated with the conceptual art movement, some of the 99 theses of conceptual art. Mm -hmm. But yours, yours are um, distinctive in that they're not commands. No, they're a past part of his participle when they're, in, when they're in action. Yeah. That's not a command. Exactly. Well, let's talk about the uh, past part of supply. This is something I else. have made mistakes about the commanding. Learn to read art is something that I really think makes a lot of sense, but I'm sorry I said learn to read art. You regret it because it's an yeah, order. You can read, it should have been you can read art, but it, it wasn't, and it's a long time ago. I was thinking about that last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, and when did you make that piece? Oh, it wasn't a piece. It was. Uh, it was a bookmark, wasn't it, for it was, Printed Matters at the first form that was, that took? Uh, somebody I, I love and respect was running a, a space, and it was a space of something I believe in, which is artist books. And they needed something for it, and I thought that was a good quip, learn to read art, and it worked. And, but it was, we're talking about something that was, what, nearly two decades ago? I have no idea. Yeah, I think I it was think, something I like two so. decades ago, and Lawrence was regretting it last night because it's a little, just a little too obstreperous. <laughs> Learn to read art. Yeah. But it's not in keeping with that sort of ethos. Um, that, well, it is really because, in fact, there's nobody saying learn to read art or. There's no or else <laughs> behind no or it. Else, yeah. yeah. It's just an, an, an observation. But I do think that uh, things like art education and art books and such give people a means to step outside of themselves and look about their place within the world. One of the advantages of using language is that it's translatable. If you're dealing with two pieces of stone, they're called one thing in one language and another in another, but in fact, they don't float. So there's, there's stone. It's such a funny, um, you know, the, the amazing thing about following you um, as long as I have is that I still don't understand, um, and that is what makes me so happy. And I, I, you know, I'm curious about the, what you think about, you've talked about perplexity. Yes. I would just like to maybe ha hear a little bit about what you think about the power of perplexity, why being perplexed is important. Because most people spend most of the resources of whatever culture they're in protecting themselves from any kind of perplexion. Uh, you don't have to believe in magic to be or alchemy to believe in something special happening when you mix one material with another. That's that simple. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the, um, the idea of um, the fact that language can be translated, as you say. Mm -hmm. um, sort of the, the conventional wisdom would be that at much of the time art has tried to achieve uh, a status of universality, or we've had this idea that like music, the whole, one of the premises of abstraction mm -hmm. was that you could create a universal language mm -hmm. um, that would help to unite the world, knit yeah. the world mm -hmm. together. Um, in a way, you sort of believe the opposite. Um, you, you are very precise and specific about meaning, mm -hmm. and you like that those meanings can be translated directly into yes. other languages. Or close, yeah. Or close enough. But it's very hard if you're out on the ocean to talk about the sand. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> what, what does that mean? 
<laughs> you have to take into account that there are some cultures that have one attitude towards materials and others. What you're trying to do is to deal with the substance, not even with the material itself, with the substance and the subsequent uh, relationship of one object next to another. That's all art is. I mean, it's red as well as green as well as blue. The, the, all the meanings we're giving things are, are meanings that we give it. And somebody put together a package, which they called art, that let you play with those meanings. They let you riff it down. One, one, two, three, one, one, through, three, two, one, one, two, three, three, two, one, two, three, one, et cetera. And there is no right answer. Yeah. The idea of translating into the intelligence of art, the uh, criticism of art, what is no longer even used in finances is algorithms. Sounds so good, it made you sound so intelligent. I'm a semiotician using algorithms. So it means it's actuarial, it's, it's insurance policy, it's taking a long list, <laughs> making a list, act, counting it up, and saying, oh, that will run. But the purpose of art is not to run, it's not to, makes something that fits into the structure. It's something that makes the structure adapt to it. Yeah. You, it's something you say often and that really sticks with me is, and I think is incredibly good uh, for students to hear is question logic systems. Yes, you question philosophical systems and logic systems. And then you come up with interesting questions and interesting propositions. They test the digital age is, it, is it leaving people out in the cold no, it's not. The point is, is that one sort of like a little part of the digital will always work with the other little part of the digital. They don't really care. They don't care what size they are, what color they are. They work together. Once you know that, that means there's no hierarchy. Once there's no hierarchy, art can't even be used for any, any established religion because there has to be a hierarchy. It can't be used for any established point because there has to be a hierarchy. Somebody has to be in control. In art, nobody has to be in control. The interesting thing is you're not really anti-systems. You're really not anti-anything, but you I am anti a lot of. Be... I'm anti a lot of things. I, oh, well, okay, yeah. I'm, I'm not including like war, our current administration. I mean, that's obviously there's oh, a good Oh, and also the way it. people think. If they can understand a Mondrian, it's very hard for them to, to be a racist. If they understand that one pixel and another pixel together work, it's very hard to justify one being above the other. But you had, a, you had an interesting meeting with um, Skidmore Owings and Merrill Architects, a huge group of them uh, in the yeah. World Trade Center. It was under construction, and it's a fascinating conversation because you're Those talking Those kids were to, interesting, weren't they? Yeah, they're fascinating. You're, and you were talking to the power structure in architecture building. No, no, I enormous. was talking to a group of people that they brought in, students young people that they wanted to train. But there were those train. partners there too. They, they, oh, they were all there, but yeah. they wanted to train them and they wanted to take them on. But that wasn't the power. The power was that these students, these young people, in standing in this, in this tower that, we, that was being built with the wind whipping through, they realized that they could bring to it a certain kind of necessity and dignity. Yeah. Well, you were really trying to inspire them. No, I was to, trying to, 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 to guide them along that they would take their own. People don't need inspiration. You know, the trouble with contemporary art is that it, it changed sides and it brought in all of these strange people, marketing people and all of that. And they really believed something that's not true. People are not stupid. And you know, just because they don't like what you make doesn't make them dumb. It means they don't like what you make. <laughs> but you were trying to encourage them to uh, architecture is in a profession that has so many built-in constraints mm -hmm. and so many um, codes codes and I mean yeah just I mean just dealing with the codes alone is is yeah, so insane and there are entire departments in firms yeah. like SOM to deal with code issues but you were trying to help them step to one side of all of that I was not trying to help anybody. <laughs> I was doing what I chose as a role that nobody asked me to do. 
that I have no qualification for and I have no certificate for. I was trying to show them that there was another side to most logical questions. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, I think that came through. Um, I think that came through even for the partners who were in the room and were responding to yeah, the I'm questions not, yeah. that you were asking about why why does a building have to, you were just relating the fact yeah. that the original Trade Center Towers blocked all of the sun in yeah, that, your neighborhood. Yeah, that's a real personal thing. I woke up when, while they were building it and realized that Bleecker Street and Bowery, where I lived for so many years, uh, had no more sun. And I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> but it's a, you were asking a really good question, a really interesting and important question, which is who decided and at what point did somebody decide that the mission of this building was to block the sun? Yes, it is the mission of the building because they, they certainly were competent enough to figure out a way not to. Right. It's called donating. <laughs> <laughs> Just for your backyard, but no. The um, but uh, the the point is to to try to again. Architecture has so many systems, and they're so hard to get around. Mm. And um, but nonetheless, you were suggesting ways to well, think outside those or around those. Or I know I'm being too directive. I don't know if I was suggesting. Look, I had a long conversation with an architect who I find really interesting is John Nouvel in a magazine, and, and it was about... That's a great interview, too, by the way. The also, also anthologized. Yeah, and uh, the point is, is that who are we to decide what architecture works and what doesn't? Uh, you can go in places like the Outback and, and wander around naked with a whole lot of people in the middle of the night and spend the night with the rain coming down and animals you're terrified of slithering by. Uh, and yet... There are people laughing and playing and everything else, and then you get to a very ensconced building, very comfortable, and they're bombed out of their skull on downers or, or anything else because they're so unhappy. So where is the success? Architecture, if you want to, keeps the rain off your head. Um, if you don't want it, you don't need it, you know, maybe. I want to go back to Ver just a sec to roll because you, you often, um, I'm not going to use the word that you use here, but um, you often say that an artist's job is to mess things up. Um, you, you occasionally phrase it slightly differently. But, um, you know, the idea, I'm, I'm very curious because, uh, especially for a, for a student crowd, how do you learn, because you are such a productive, you may hate this, but you're an incredibly productive member of society, mm -hmm. um, how do you learn how to be a productive troublemaker? How do you? I'm not a troublemaker. You, you are. No, I'm terribly sorry. If somebody's getting it wrong and you turn to them and say, look, if you put, you know, you piss in your, in your soup, it's not going to taste good. That, that, that's not a rabble rouser. That's just sort of noticing something and pointing. That's not troublemaking from that's your point of view. That's not troublemaking at all. Or that art is supposed to incorporate all different cultures at a given time without one having to be higher than the other. That's not a troublemaker. That's not doing the wrong thing. My guess is that the emperor, when the little boy pointed to him and said, he's wearing no clothes, I'm pretty sure the emperor thought of him as a troublemaker. I have no idea. I've never had the, the uh, experience of hanging out with an emperor, but I've been around... <laughs> People who have come up with ideas mathematically and, and intelligently that really did not fly very well, but they were right. So maybe the emperor was right. And was, the little boy was right. The emperor had no clothes, but maybe clothes weren't necessary. That was a good thing. No, maybe they weren't necessary. It doesn't, <laughs> just because you don't want something to happen doesn't make it necessarily a bad thing. And just because you do the opposite doesn't make what you do necessarily a good thing. And I'm not being nicey-nicey because I'm not a nicey-nicey person. I think if you're an asshole, you're an asshole. It's that simple. We live in a country that now lets anything go by. Big deal. That doesn't make it true. And art is the same thing. Just because it can be sold or packaged doesn't make it true. Um, this is a slight segue and jog, but it's um, something that I've been interested in for a long time, is you, you separate your own aesthetics 
your own aesthetic values and judgments um, that you have about the work that you make, the physical mm. form yeah. that your work takes yeah. when you make it for a client like SCAD. Any place, yeah. um, you separate that out from the meaning that the work has. The work retains the same meaning no matter what the form of its presentation is. Somebody else, could, somebody else can make one of those works oh, I in another that. form, yeah. and you have often said, you may not like how they make it, but that wouldn't make it wrong and it wouldn't make it different. That's good. I don't like the word right and wrong at this point. We're not with art. Yeah. Some things are wrong, but that's not because there's a right. It's because they happen to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> What, what is very, it? Very, very serious about that. What is it? What is it like to spend as much time and put as much energy into creating the specific form of a work, when at some level you don't believe that it's important? I didn't say it wasn't important or necessary. What's the right word? Necessary. Necessary. Okay. But once you have you to do be it, very precise when you're talking. Once about you, words. well, you don't have to be precise. You just have to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right and wrong, it's like frying an egg. It, you either got it or you don't get it, and when, it, when, you, don't, when it, you don't get it, it burns. <laughs> and maybe burnt egg is good, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, arts, as I said, art's one of those things where if you don't take the chance when you make art, what a waste of the privilege that you've taken. Because whether you have all of the degrees, whether you went to every school and you did everything correctly, it's a great privilege to be able to place something in the society and see how it works. It's like graffiti. Um, when graffiti is there, it has a right to be there. If it says, the sky is blue or my children are hungry, as long as it says something, not me, George, 42nd Street. <laughs> um, you had a... a conversation that's um, again published great conversation with Benjamin Buclo and um, you so he sort of walked you through talking about painting um, from your era and um, one of the really interesting things that you said is, is as much as you admire Jasper Johns yeah. you said he never took a risk in his entire career at least up until now and no, now he's the, 95 the, and you saw it because Rosenberg was taking risk after risk after risk alongside you he was a contemporary of Jasper Johns so I was impressed more by Rauschenberg than I was by Johns. But Johns is a great painter, and that's quite skill. I, I was a painter. Uh, painterly skill is not easy to acquire, but once you acquire it, you have it. I, they'd say it's the same if you learn how to drive, but I wouldn't know. <laughs> Cause yeah, we were talking earlier that you know how to hotwire a car, but not how to drive one. Yeah, because that you can get out of a little book that says the way things work. It tells you which wire goes where, and you <laughs> put it together, and the car starts. That's, that strikes me as a very um, Bronx, New York story. More or less. Origin yeah, story. Or New York City story, or Chicago story, or Los Angeles story, or Savannah story. It really depends upon what, where you're coming from in it. And it all works out, usually, in the end. But it does require, uh, I think everybody in this room that wants to make art, that does make art, if you come with such a positive thing that you're really laying something out for somebody to see, uh, you've done the right thing. And whether it's important or it's not important historically, uh, history does change its temperament. But I think that uh, my work itself only survived, and I'm only here because uh, I have a really funny feeling that there's a dignity to showing something to people. Not telling somebody, there's a difference between showing and telling. You talk about dignity a lot. Um, yeah. In the film that um, we heard at the beginning, um, there was a quotation of yours, or I think um, President uh, Wallace talked about it, the dignity of materials, respecting your materials. Yeah. Um, but you, you respect your viewer, you respect, uh, you, you have a deep respect, well, in a way not for, you, you poke holes in language and truth and specificity, and I mean, you, you sort of, you, uh, in a way you come out of a tradition, you, you came up with artists who were sort of like combat philosophers mm. in a way, um, yeah. but you have uh, um, respect and dignity are so much at the heart of what you do and your spirit 
just curious, where, where does that come from, do you think, for you? That I have absolutely no idea. Uh, you didn't have an easy upbringing. You, you I didn't have that hard an upbringing. My parents were quite nice. They just were not successful. That's different. Yeah. No, it really is. Uh, my parents, I, I, my parents were New Yorkers. They were born and raised in New York, and they believed in education, and they believed in public education intensely. That's good enough. It doesn't matter what they teach, if they, what they believe should be taught and what shouldn't. Uh, I think that that kind of social conscience is what the the bombast now are calling socialist leanings. I'd be damned if, I, if even, you know, like if somebody gets a roof over their head and the kid gets taught to read and write, and if they get sick, there's a doctor and there's a public library. If that's socialism, they really ought to run for it because it's a good idea. <laughs> um, yeah. When, when did you realize or when did you decide, this is something you've talked a fair amount about too, that you were an activist? I'm not an that, activist. That was part of your I role. was a kid who had no... I was a kid who was not being let into things and shown things and allowed into places because of my background. And my background was the only thing wrong with it was my parents were not successful. And my father went off in the war and, and, and came back. He came back fine. But I mean in the sense of um, wanting, believing that your art is about making the world better. You really are progressive and, and activist in that sense. Oh, that's not activism. I think every single human being in this room, given the opportunity, and I have the opportunity to place something in public that might let somebody else understand better their own place in the world, that's not activism. That's just a responsibility of finding yourself in the right position at the right time. Now, well, most people don't get the position that what they have to say means anything. And I always feel that if you have a position that you've noticed with these interviews for the televisions and European television and this and that, if you don't use it to talk about the things that you don't want to see happen, you are really and truly wasting something. If you can get up and sing a song or do a dance or make a, a work of art that, that perplexes people and you don't throw in your little little thing on the side of anti-racist or anti-this or anti-that, I think you're, you're, you're giving yourself a short shrift. Um, well, just you know to say, you're not I, letting yourself bring your own dynamics to a whole. And the whole point of an art education well, I would like to see more academic and academic things. The more things you learn, the better your art is. And not just learning about art, but I don't know about learning about the business. I genuinely don't. I, I, I don't think this professional training has anything to do with the making of art. It's like science. If you have professional training in science, you can get a good job with a company. Everything will work, but that ain't what science is about. And that ain't what art is about. Art is about presenting something that you're sure of, but nobody else even understands. Um, there's another statement I just want to um, ask you about or probe a little bit. Uh, you say, or have said often, I'm a materialist. Yeah. And um, you've made the point that art is an objective reality. Um, and the uh, last time we talked to, uh, publicly, we talked about the metaphor problem and whether art is metaphorical. Um, and uh, this seems to me to be such a sort of fundamentally sculptural idea in a way. The that art is not metaphorical. Is not metaphorical. Yeah. yeah, it seems to be one of the things that really makes your work specifically sculptural. But the not, idea ju that not just me. I mean, dozens and dozens of dozens of other artists the reason that you can use them, that you can come to them, and it doesn't matter what culture they came out of, it's not metaphor. It is what it is. But so many of the people who think about you and write about you are confused by this and perplexed because it looks like poetry, it smells like poetry, it sometimes acts like poetry, or it's easy to misinterpret as poetry. Oh. So There's we immediately go to language structures or our understanding of language structures. Or a misunderstanding, yeah, sociological yeah. understanding of the world through language. It doesn't work. Uh, I'm a great admirer of Chomsky, but it, it, it doesn't work. In a, in a way, you're, are you using language specifically to sort of punch through that and turning no, it into an objective reality? It, it, I'm, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. With, yeah, no, of course. I'm using language 
because it's a way of talking about materials that occur in different cultures and have different value structures in those cultures and at the same time are exactly the same thing. That interests me. But that is not a met there is no metaphor in it. So Stalin called himself Stalin, which means steel in, in Russian. Hooray. <laughs> yeah, that's such a... Um... <laughs> Yeah, I'm still trying to get my head around that Yeah, one. I'm very serious about that. I was, not, I was not trying to make a quip or, or be amusing. But the point is, is that we, we have such advantages here. We have such resources to waste them on petty little differences to differentiate you from somebody else and somebody from somebody else. When all you have to do is make something that they don't know what the hell to do with. You've done it. <laughs> because what, what does that do for the person from your point of view? What does it mean? It means that uh, either somebody scared the living shit out of them when they were young and told them not to think past outside of their box. And if they stay in their box, they'll have a comfortable enough existence. You don't choose art for that. There's other things that you can choose. You can even do medicine for that because there's a whole caretaking period. It's not about caretaking. It's not about people's ego, and it's not about how they feel. It's about how they understand where they are, and that will determine their place in the world. Um, so let's the, you've formulated that in, in often in a really lovely way as well, or many different lovely ways, mm -hmm. but you, you've talked quite a lot about grace, um, the idea of grace, and that your, your pieces or you hope that your pieces give people the opportunity to move through the world gracefully or with I should grace. hope so. Don't you, I mean, when you're watching a movie, even in somebody's dancing, don't you see yourself in that position? You don't see yourself falling on a pratfall. You see yourself dancing gracefully through the situation. Well, art will allow that if you, if you, if you, that's why I like books so much. It takes it out of the context of power. You know, all of these uh, regimes through our childhood, through my parents' childhood, through everybody's life, uh, they censor books. Books turn up everywhere. It's not like digital where they turn off the power, it's gone. Books, they end up in, under the bed, they end up here, they end up there. If you can put something of substance inside that book, you have something that enters every single culture it finds itself in. It's just a matter of them learning how to read it. Because it's, um, and forgive me for stupidly oversimplifying, but is it because that it, it, you're handing somebody content that is empowering? It's empowerment and it, let's say, and I've never thought of it this way, but what if a reasonably made work of art is a Rosetta Stone? Yeah. to understanding the aspirations of other people. Once you understand their aspirations, you can justify your own. And I sound, I make, sound like I'm making pronouncements and I don't mean to. It's just that there, there's a whole part that we've lost because of the commercialization, the commodification of things that we've lost to take away the fact that people do things because they have aspirations and dreams. God knows what they are, and, God, and I don't know if they're good or they're bad, but they're aspirations and dreams. So many of the gestures in your work, for me, suggest that. Yeah. They're, those arrows, they don't know where they're going, many no. of them. No. But they're, they're sort of profoundly moving vectors. Mm. Um, of a direction that they could start to move in. Yeah. Yeah. A vector. Well, you know, in medicine, vector is that which carry the disease carrier is the vector. The good carrier is the vector. I, I meant the positive kind. Anthropology. And with regard to your work. Uh, well, the way we're living now, anthropology as a vector is a, is a bad choice because that just means it was a car ad and they ran somebody over. <laughs> <laughs> Right, it's a terrible, terrible marketing word. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It sounds like the next Toyota model. Exactly, the vector. The vector. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm sorry for using the word at all. 
But I still love the sense of uh, uh, a sort of empowering uncertainty that's in those yes. eras. You calling them insurgencies. You know, there's a, there's a little problem here. When we speak this way, we're saying that what we're confronted with is, a, is the way the world is. That's a catechism of a sort. That, that, that's a kind of, maybe it ain't the way we're seeing it. Maybe it is something else. And what the other person is saying is that, look, it doesn't work that way. It works this way. Well, I think what I love so much about your work is that it makes me uh, realize I don't know anything. Um, and I'm not certain about anything. And um, although I grew up is in it? a habit of speaking in a way that makes it sound as if I know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, I'm pretty sure that I don't. And actually, I'm pretty OK with that. And I thank your work, uh, in part, for getting to the well, point of that perspective. Well, do you see what happens when, you, when you're a person who doesn't know anything or do anything? You end up backing a horse like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of lovely. Um, you know, I just, uh, well, maybe. No, if you can't give yourself dignity, then there's really no reason for me to make art for it. Um, <laughs> Dignity, we've talked about dignity, we've talked about grace, yeah. we've talked about finding your place in the sun, yeah. an incredibly beautiful yeah. metaphor. Um, but I, you know, in, in the end, you have a kind of a phrase that you use, but for me, what it sort of boils down to is that um, these objects are about making connections. It's people connecting with an object, as you often say, it's objects connecting with mm -hmm. other objects, but within the context of humanity, um, the context of people and human interactions. But you're, you're really making, maybe vectors was a, maybe a terrible word, but you're, you're making connectors. They're switches. They're I'm giving a possibility to connect things, yeah. I'm not making connectors. I'm not making connectors. It's the possibility of the connection. The possibility. Yeah. And that I can't think of any yeah, better. I can't think of anything better than art for people to make to try to, to talk about those aspirations that they have. You know, there's this silly story I keep telling, and it's, it's the true story of Jean-Paul Sartre. Uh, who had flaws, and, but he was an interesting, honest human being, and he was supportive of human rights and human dignity. His colleagues came to him one day and said, Jean-Paul, you cannot go in the street selling this magazine called Humanité in Paris. You're above it. And he looked and he said, no, from 7 o'clock in the morning till 12, I'm the greatest literature of France has ever produced, and I'm doing my, my, my book on, on Malmé or something. And, uh, or Balzac, and, and they turned to him and he, and he said, but after 12 o'clock, je suis sur mon ton citoyen de la France. I'm so just a French citizen, and this is what I have to say. Now, why can't we go about it that way? The, the reason is if you're anti-things and you're anti-sexism, anti-racism, the more you can accomplish in the world, the more strength it gives to your st statement. That's it. So basically, it's win-win. Do the right thing, and it's win-win. I think that's, um, that's a great place to end. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to take some questions from the audience at this point, if there are questions from the audience. Hi. Hi, if you can, can raise your hand, it. I'll come with you to a microphone. Hello, um, how's it going? Um, I just wanted to ask, what's the um, typeface that you use in uh, most of your work? It's very nice. Did you hear? No, I didn't. Uh, what is the typeface that you use in many of your works? It's very nice. The typeface? The typeface. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find, when I was putting the work together in an early stage, a sans serif face that a font that didn't have any authority. And uh, Helvetica, Helvetica had lost itself and became the authoritative font of intellectual and smart people. So I set about designing a typeface and in the face of it all, it turned out to be the right choice. It's a nice typeface. It's called Margaret Seaworthy Gothic. And it works. It's not authoritative, but it's non-sense serif and it has a certain elegance to it. 
And then there are other typefaces I discovered that I used, like F.F. Hoffland, that had the same thing. They had a, somebody did the same thought. My typeface is just capital letters because I just made it for the work. And, but that's why it's not poetry. <laughs> So, you earlier said you considered yourself a materialist. So I wanted to know, for you, what's the definition of materialist? What is materialism for you? Because you're sharing ideas with the text, not just the material. I am not following. I, I'm not. In, in all fairness, I accused Lawrence of saying that, and he has said that at times. Um, it's the um, I, I said that you called yourself a materialist. I am a materialist. The, the, the work is determined by the material. I don't... And she's I, asking just what you mean by that. I work. only make work that anybody that finds it because can reproduce it if they want. It may not be as graceful and it may not be as this, but it's not at all exclusive. It's not something special. The work, when it's put together, is special. It's like an egg, shortening, and heat is material. The fact that somebody can make a souffle out of it, that's art. But it's the same thing. I'm a materialist. I'm determined and held by all the materials. Secondly, I really like to only make work of things that are accessible to other people. That's also very egocentric on my part because then they can appreciate how well I've done with the material. <laughs> <laughs> when it's an imaginary material, they know you can't... You can't take any credit or feel good about it, but when you have something that everybody has access to and you do something sort of okay, hey, that's pretty good. That's positive. There have been times and places where there have been ex uh, exhibitions where other people have made your works. What have you thought about those? As what the do way mean, other people have executed, built the work? Have other people or have built, sorry, excuse it? me. Yes, other people have Oh, yes, have of built course, that's fine. It, 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 the nature of the work is such that as long as the content isn't changed, the meaning isn't changed. Why not? Despite whatever aesthetic. Yeah, I much prefer to have control, but if you don't have control, it's not the end of the world. That's an amazing point of view. We have a question. I don't think it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked with a lot of artists. It's an amazing per perspective. We have a question here. You said earlier that uh, you don't need a piece of paper to tell you that you're an artist, but then you also were talking about the value of an art education. Yeah. Can you speak to many of the students here who are going to school for both, maybe? I don't teach for, as I said, too many times, I think. Uh, in order to be a good teacher, you have to have an authority. You have a responsibility for the people who give you their time, and often they earn money to do it. They give you their time to study. Uh, artists are not supposed to have authority. And the teachers have to have authority. So I never could make the reconciliation, so I did, decided not to teach. And uh, I, an art education should be literally that. Learn every damn thing you can. If somebody knows how to make ink prints, if somebody knows how to make um, metal prints, it's a mat water. It's not what you do, it's what it is done for. Uh, when I'm traveling, sometimes you, you end up in, in a seminar and you look at somebody and say, You have to tell me what it is you want to do and then show me how you did it. Not what kind of object you want to make, what you're trying to say, what you're trying to show, what the reason for that object, for the reason for that room, that museum is, what you want to be doing. And then we can determine whether it succeeds or it fails. But you've also been clear in your own um process your own life that it, it can take a long time and do you may have to do a lot of making before you figure out what it is you want to say. Gee whiz, you know, some jobs are easy and some jobs are hard. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we're looking at people, what is this? What is our, you know, you're perplexed by something, you're looking at that wall, you want to build a wall, you have to learn how to build a wall. But some jobs are harder. That's the way it goes. 
An artist is a hard job. Yeah, it, it, an artist is, is not an easy job, but it is a very good job, basically. I mean, not as far as remuneration and things go, but it's a very good job. It's, it's like a prime job. I'm very pleased that I fell into making that decision to be an artist. I think we're going to take one more question. We have one question right over here. Yes. Hi. Um, just a personal question. Like, um, like before, where you're not, not, not like famous as now, and you create a work, like a sculpture or something, like people are not understand you, or they have like different perspective. Like, uh, how do how do you like solve it? I mean, you know, things like that. I don't understand that. I, I don't know. I'm coming from another generation. Remember, I uh -huh. came from a generation that got along very well with the older artists, but they didn't like what I did. And I didn't have any place to show, so I was lucky. I found myself in a group of people around all over the world who didn't have any place to show. And we put together an idea, and we have what we now call the art world. <laughs> uh, that's it. It had nothing to do with anybody setting it up for us. It was, it was not a lure or a trap or something. You just you kept putting it out until people realized that it was useful. And once they did, somehow or other, it got used. And you know what happens? Sometimes it doesn't. And somebody supposedly wastes their life. No. They chose a profession that every morning it gave them some satisfaction that they're, what they're trying to do. And it, it just didn't have any success in the culture they found themselves in. That's not a, that's not a failure. It just didn't have any success. It's not always pro and con. I don't know how I feel. I'm very pleased with the fact that I'm able to make a living now. But uh, I don't know. Alice and I sort of, we decided to make a kid in 1969 when I was, like I was pretty established by that time, but I was not making any money. And somehow or other, we had the privilege of raising one, doing the whole number, and I did what I thought was the right thing to do. And we managed. And some people try it and they don't manage. Not because they failed, but because the circumstances did. Still, it's still a very good endeavor. Whether you can get away with it or not, that's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> it um, genuinely is. There can't be no classes in it because that means you're, under, you're believing in a system that you claim you're building art to destroy. You're biting the hand that feeds you, so... Uh, Sometimes it slaps. <laughs> um, thank you. Please, uh, thank you so yeah, much. Thank Lord. you so please all very much. Join me in thanking Lord. No, really, thank you very much.